Get Rich Education is brought to you by Narada Real Estate, the real asset investor, and Highlands Residential Mortgage. Are you on track to achieve your financial goals? Income-producing real estate is the most historically proven way to accumulate wealth and has created more financial freedom than any other means. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best turnkey cash flow rental properties. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly income. Get your free strategy session with our knowledgeable investment counselors at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Hey, welcome to Get Rich Education, episode 135. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, and today we're talking with an investor that has owned 2,000 single-family homes and apartment units. At one time, I think he felt like he was on top of the real estate investing mountain. In fact, he was worth $50 million in 2008, and his net worth quickly evaporated all the way down to zero as he got caught up in the mortgage meltdown, the housing crisis. That's because today's guest didn't focus on cash flow. That's what can happen to you when you don't focus on cash flow. We're going to discuss single family versus multifamily properties since he's owned tons of both types and his lessons learned from the housing crash. We're also going to talk about the psychology of taking action. I'm going to come back and talk more with you one on one after chatting with our guest first. Today's guest really has a compelling rags to riches story. He's a real estate investor, entrepreneur, multiple business owner, author, mentor, peak performance coach, and a community philanthropist who's really passionate about business, life, success, and giving back. He's really one of the country's top real estate investors because he's personally owned and managed over 2,000 apartments and homes. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Rod Cleef. Hey, Keith. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great to have you here. Rod joins us from Sarasota, Florida today. So, Rod, you've got so much experience in both single family and multifamily. So what are your thoughts on the differences between the two types? Well, you know, my story is I've owned over 2,000 houses in multiple apartment communities, and I love single family. I made a lot of money with single family. I got caught in the crash of 2008 here in Sarasota, and I had 800 houses when 08 hit. And because I was focused on value instead of cash flow, for example, in 2006, my net worth went up $17 million in one year just from appreciation. And of course, I thought I could do no wrong. And, you know, I got a big head and I was practically probably insufferable at the time. But sure. I will tell you that when that happens, the universe or God or whatever you believe typically will smack you down. And that's what happened to me in 2008. And that's right, when everyone was feeling invincible. Right. And I was focused on value instead of cash flow. And I got the memo. What was interesting for me was my single family portfolio suffered uh, and I lost a lot of it, but my multifamily did okay. But for a lot of reasons, like I just said, because I was focused on the wrong thing. And I think single family is a great place to start and it's a great investment opportunity. Me personally, now I lean more towards multifamily because of the personal experience that I had. Now, I want to caveat my experience with my 800 houses in that I had probably over leveraged a little bit and I had definitely bought in markets that were challenging because the taxes are very high here in Florida. A lot of my properties were in wind and flood zones. So the insurance was very, very high as well. And, but I will tell you that there's still great markets here in Florida and all over the country where you can make great money buying and holding single family or flipping or wholesaling single family. I just decided to focus on multifamily. Because of the seminar that I had, uh, I don't call them failures. It was a massive seminar in uh-huh. 2008 because it was a learning experience. That's where my focus has gone. Yeah, that's smart to call it a seminar. It's kind of like laboratory work. You were working in the field and learning at the same time. And yeah, fortunately or unfortunately, they were your properties that were the subject there. So there's just so many advantages and disadvantages to single family versus multifamily one way or the other. And uh, 
I'd like to get your thoughts on something. I want to bring up something that I think a lot of people don't consider when they're in real estate investing. When someone considers purchasing a single family income property versus a multifamily, they might put profit and loss statements next to each other side by side, and they kind of try to decide what they want, and they'll compare projected monthly profit and loss for each property type. Now, oftentimes the apartment building looks better on paper due to that economies of scale arbitrage that you had there. But you know what? A lot of times I see it end up down the road. In actuality, a year or two later, the single family home was more profitable, and here's why. As we know, Nothing hurts our cash flow more than vacancy and turnover as real estate investors and the subsequent renovation that occurs following turnover. And in a single family home, a tenant treats the property more like their own. It kind of feels like their own and they're more likely to stay longer and that tenant's happier. And the single family home investor, therefore, makes out better because they're not dealing with highly transient tenants that leave apartment investors disappointed with higher vacancy and turnover or expenses than they calculated back on that original profit and loss a year or two ago. What are your thoughts there? Well, I, I, I don't, you know, I have had the experience that you're describing for apartment owners on my single family properties because I had a low end portfolio. So I had plenty of turnover and trashed properties and whatnot too. I think it's very, fairly subjective. And I know that there are apartment communities, certainly in the B and A and B class apartments that, that don't have what you're describing. But if you're talking about D properties, C and D properties, both in apartments and in houses, you're going to have turnover. You're going to have tenants that don't have a, a pride of ownership. But I don't know that I agree with your statement on a global level. I definitely, yeah. in a micro level, I agree with it. And again, it's the class of property that you end up buying. If you're in a C or a D neighborhood, you have a chance that you're going to have somebody that really doesn't have pride of ownership, but either in a single family or in a multifamily, because I've had both. And, and I've had people in apartments that have taken very, very good care of their pro and lived there for decades. But the same thing has happened in a house. I agree that if you're in B and C plus houses, you're going to get pride of ownership probably more often with a house when, than you would with an apartment. But I think it's a little bit subjective and, and you just have to be careful where you buy. I've had properties in the roughest of the rough areas in Denver and Florida and people killed in and around my properties. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. They're great for cash flow, but they're a management nightmare. And those were houses for the most part. So I think it's important for you to pay attention to the areas that you're in, the submarkets that you're in, and just, you know, take a look at the crime statistics in whatever area you're buying in. We've got such great resources to do that these days with spotcrime.com and websites like that. So you can see, you know, for example, where you live compares to a property you might be interested in. And I just think that's a component, Keith, in all fair candor. Yeah, it sure is. It seems like when people anticipate getting into something and buy something, they spend a lot more time projecting how that's going to look. And maybe they very well should spend plenty of time, but almost no one does that. I'll call it an actuarial analysis. Let's look back on the past year or two and see what really happened and see what was really more profitable, single family or a small multifamily. So any other thoughts with single family versus multifamily advantages, pros and cons, things people might not be thinking about, but should be? For those of your listeners that are interested in getting into real estate, I think that they should explore both. And I think there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, based on my seminar, like I say, I prefer multifamily, but I, again, I, I have owned 2,000 houses, so I obviously liked single family and I made a lot of money in single family. I would consider both. I'm not so sure I'd recommend doing what I did, having hundreds of properties in a market. It's a logistical nightmare. And although I was good at it, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But, you know, if you've got a good management team or you're a good manager yourself, I love single family. So you have to do your self-evaluation and see what's going to work best for you. So that would be my counsel on that. And hindsight's always 2020, And I really appreciate you bringing up your mistake because we can learn from that. How much better off do you think you would have been back when you were purchasing all the single family homes when you owned those 800 properties if you would have been in multiple metro markets? How do you think that would have looked differently? Oh, I think that would have been, a, a, frankly, a, a train wreck. In fact, I was in one, basically, I had houses two hours south and two hours north and everywhere in between. And logistically, it was a real challenge just in my own backyard here. Because if you can imagine, you know, if you need to show a property for rent, and you've got to drive two hours to show it. And let's say they don't show up, for example, or if you've got a maintenance situation, 
and you send a maintenance tech out to fix something, they've got to evaluate what's going on and then drive to the local hardware store. So for me, logistically, the way I did it really didn't make sense. And, you know, it's because it was comfortable and I enjoyed it and I liked it as I stuck with it and did it. And I was real good at it. I mean, I had 500 houses in Denver at one time, the same situation that I sold to buy in Florida and a couple of hundred houses in Memphis and, you know, ultimately 13, 1400 houses in Florida and apartment complexes in each of those as well. I just wouldn't wish my model on anybody because I finally got the memo. If you're going to buy that much scale, I highly recommend you go multifamily because it's just easier to have them all in one location. If you're just doing one-offs and buying a few houses, no problem. But if you're going to do whole boatload, I'd recommend you do multifamily. That's just my personal opinion, Keith. Right. Okay. So rather than approaching it like using turnkey operators in multiple markets where they have management in place and tenants already in a property and the property already renovated, you just did it somewhat differently. And it sounds like you did some self-management because you sort of enjoyed that. No, I totally self-managed. And so if you're doing turnkeys and you've got good operators that are managing the properties, that's a totally different environment. But, you know, for me, I've always self-managed. I like self-management. And for those of your listeners that want to manage on their own, you know, it's just I wouldn't do what I did where you're, you know, scattered out over a big geographic area. Again, and now I'm not talking multiple markets. I wasn't in multiple markets at one time. I, for a while there, I had houses in Memphis and in Florida, and the, the Memphis houses that I was self-managing became a stepchild. But you know, if you've got a good team in place remotely, then fine, you're probably fine. Yeah, that's more about uh, what we talk about doing on Get Rich Education. But you know, a lot of your really your body of work, you've really been motivating the people because you talk about how someone can embody the drive, just that psychological drive to make it big in business or investing or real estate. So tell us more about how does one embody that drive? Sure. And I'm sure there are a lot of your listeners that listen to these podcasts and they never take action. And I'll tell you, you know, going from being worth $50 million to nothing here in 2008, is a pretty sobering experience. And if I hadn't spent a lot of time around Tony Robbins, around his technology, and learned how to change your meaning on what happens to you and learn how to self-motivate, you know, I could have let that destroy me. And I didn't. I was immediately rebounded back and I built a $10 million litigation support company. And, you know, and I'm back now in the real estate game. I think for those of you listening that want to take action, I'm going to suggest something to you. And I learned about visualizing and manifesting things in my life at a young age, and I didn't realize what it was I was doing, but I want to give you some examples if you'll humor me for a minute, Keith. Yeah. You know, for example, when I turned 18, I got my real estate license, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I bought this four-door Ford Granada. It was the ugliest thing you'd ever seen, but I thought I had to have a four-door to go out and sell houses. I was a broker in Colorado, but uh, I worked for another broker, and he had a Corvette, and he let me drive his Corvette, and I just thought that was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And so, you know, got a picture of a Corvette. Back then, there wasn't Google or anything like that. So I got a picture of a, out of a magazine. I put it on the visor of my four-door Granada. And sure enough, a year later, I had the Corvette. And I'm going to give you a couple other examples. And I want to tell your listeners right out of the gate that this is not me bragging. This is just me sharing my story. In fact, the things I'm going to describe to you here don't even really motivate me anymore. But they're great for illustrative purposes. Okay. I had this Corvette, and back then there was a TV show called Magnum P.I. It had Tom Selleck was the star, and he drove this Ferrari 308, this red Ferrari, which I thought was the coolest thing ever. So I got a picture of that Ferrari, and I put that on the visor in my Corvette. And sure enough, a year or two later, I got a Maserati. Actually, it looked just like the Ferrari. And my last story there is I always wanted a Lamborghini. I'm the guy that had the posters in his room with the bikini girls and the Lamborghinis and pictures of them. And I just thought they were the coolest thing ever. And I'll even tell you, I even told my son when he was eight or 10 years old that I was thinking about getting one someday. And so he got posters and he got pictures and he actually collected models of exotic cars. And he had a, a model of the exact same color and style that I ended up getting, which I ultimately wrecked. But that's another story. I guess the moral there is I was visualizing and manifesting the things that I want because I got pictures of them. So I wanted to start with that. And let me tell you the last thing. I always wanted a house on the beach and I visualized palm trees and living on the beach for 20 years. And ultimately, I bought this lot on the water here in Sarasota and built this 10,000 square foot beautiful home. But the message there is I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, but I want to share this. So I'm floating in the pool of this vision that I would envisioned for years, and I'm looking up at this 
$8 million testament to my ego. And I got depressed and I couldn't understand it. I'm like, I achieved this massive success and I'm floating up. I'm looking at this pool, magnificent. The lights are changing colors in the pool. I've got a waterfall from the second floor into the pool. I mean, just a magnificent home and I'm depressed. And at the time, I didn't realize that there were two things going on. One of them was you should never achieve a big goal without having other goals set up beyond it. Because like the good book says, without a vision, the people perish. And I'm going to talk about goal setting in just a second. But so that's one thing that was going on. But the second thing that was going on was there's a big difference between success and fulfillment. And Tony Robbins likes to say it's the science of achievement versus the art of fulfillment. And I will tell your listeners, and I know many of you are focused on success and want to make a lot of money. Don't forget to give beyond yourself, because honestly, that's where true happiness comes in. There are lots of millionaires and billionaires out there that are not fulfilled and they're not happy because they don't give beyond themselves. So that's just an aside. But let's go to goal setting for a second. I have written my goals for years and years, and I take people through a goal setting workshop because honestly, guys, those of you listening, 80 percent of your success in anything is your psychology and only 20 percent is the actual mechanics, this real estate conversation we're having, for example. 80% of it is mindset. So I take people through a goal setting workshop and I'll just do it in, in a minute and a half here. But basically I tell people get in a high energy state, make sure you're hydrated and you're breathing well, and then put the pen to the paper and write down everything you could ever possibly want. I mean, take the lid off your mind and write down everything small and large you want, the houses, the cars, the planes, the boats, the private islands, just the, the learning another language, learning how to fly a helicopter, anything you can think of that you could ever possibly want and write it down. Don't let the pen leave the paper and just keep writing. Don't filter it. Just write down everything you could possibly want. Okay. Start to make it visual. There you go. Then you go through and you look at your list of things and you write down how long it's going to take you to get each one of those things. And remember one thing, people will overestimate what they can do in a year and they will grossly underestimate what they can do in a decade or two. So write down a, a one year, three year, five year, 10 year or 20 year by each one of those goals. OK, so go through each goal and write a one, three, five, 10 or even 20 by each goal. And when you're done with that, take your top four one year goals and flag those. And I've got two more steps here. So once you've got your top four one year goals, write down a paragraph for each one of those why they're an absolute must. And use emotionally charged words like massive and incredible and things that will charge you emotionally. Why those are an absolute must. Unfiltered. Unfiltered. Now, now, those of you listening, don't just think them in your head. You literally have to write them down. And I'll tell you why. Because there's something in your mind called the reticular activating system. And what it is, it's a mechanism that filters out all the thousands of bits of data that your brain experiences every day. And it filters them into what they, your brain subconsciously thinks is relevant. For example, remember the first time you bought a car and you never really noticed it. And then when you bought it, you notice them everywhere. Right. That's your reticular activating system at work. So you've got to the physical act of writing this down is critical. OK, so you write down your four goals. You write down your musts. And don't just write the positive must like because it'll make my spouse happy or I'll feel like a success or I'll be living the life I've always wanted. Write down some negative ones, too. Like, I don't want to feel like a failure. I don't want to feel like I let my family down. And I know that sounds rough and harsh, but people will do more to avoid pain than to gain pleasure. So make sure you write down positive and negative whys that those four year goals are a must. Oh, sure. That makes a lot of sense because fear is such a significant motivator in life. Absolutely. So then there's one step left, and that is take those four goals, go on Google and find pictures that charge you emotionally that are zero around those goals. OK, and if you go on Google, you will. There's millions of pictures there. you'll find some that charge you. Download them. Go to CVS or Walgreens or your local drugstore and have them blown up and put them where you can see them. I'll tell you a story here. I've got my planner here in front of me. In the back of my planner, I've got I'm one of these old neophytes that still uses an old written planner. It's like a Franklin Covey now. It was a daytimer. The first few, I've got pictures in sleeves, and the first few sleeves have gratitude pictures. They're my kids when they were very young. And I've had these pictures in here literally for probably 17, 18 years. I've got pictures of the Lamborghinis, the Rolls Royces, the watches, the houses. I have gotten three-fourths of the things that I have pictures of in here. So those of you that are thinking, oh, this is kind of foofy, getting a picture and doing all that, I'm just telling you it works. Like there's a story where Jim Carrey wrote himself a check for $10 million and looked at it when he was poor up by the Hollywood sign every, you know, every so often, and he ultimately got that. 
visualizing what you want works. And the reason I bring all this up, for those of you that haven't taken action, you've got to be able to push yourself to take that first step. And when you do, you're going to hit speed bumps. You're going to have bumps in the road. You're going to get your nose bloodied. And it's having these goals in front of you and why they're a must that's going to, you know, when you hit that wall, you'll be able to go around it or over it or even through it because you know what your whys are. You know what your ultimate outcomes are. And make sure your goals are specific and measurable. Don't say, I want to lose weight. I'm going to lose 10 pounds by the X or I'm going to make 100,000 by January 1st. You know, make sure they're specific and measurable, but don't underestimate the power. I mean, this stuff has kind of gone mainstream now with the secret coming out and the law of attraction and all that. And I didn't realize that's what I was doing until I saw that movie and kind of blew me away that that's what I'd done all these years. But I'm telling you guys, those of you that think this is foofy, it works. Just trust me. In fact, Olympic athletes visualize the race now. I mean, it's almost common practice that they visualize the race completely start to finish in their minds before they race because it's been proven to make them so much more effective. Visualization works. And one last thing, I do a little morning ritual every morning and I recommend it to you, those of you listening. And that is you just sit for a minute and, and literally it takes five minutes. You just sit in your chair or wherever you are, even laying in bed if you have to, but, but take five minutes and think about what you're grateful for. And things that, you know, your spouse, your children, whatever, the people who loves you, who do you love? Think about what you're grateful for for just a couple of minutes. Then think about your four one-year goals with gratitude as if you already have them, with emotion, okay, as if you already have them. Trust me, it works. You can call it prayer or you can call it visualization, whatever feels better to you. But trust me, it works. So you're thinking with gratitude as if you already have those things. And then I like to end it by just deciding that it's going to be a great day that day. It's a great morning ritual that I recommend. Something, you know, a lot of people meditate, but this is kind of like my little quick version of, because I'm very impatient, this is like my little quick version of meditation. So hopefully that added value to those of you that want to take action or maybe have hit a speed bump on your road to your definition of success. Yeah, and a lot of that's based on positivity, you know, and I think that timeline's important. A dream without a timeline, that's really just a wish, not any sort of goal. Right. And yeah, a lot of people just don't really bring enough gratefulness into their life, I think. I think a lot of people project what's next, what's next, what's next, and there isn't quite enough of the what's now gratefulness in their lives. No question. Gratitude is the absolutely the strongest emotion there is. You know, in, in my podcast, I do these little five-minute clips called Your Driving Force Success Tip, and it's all about psychology. It's about gratitude, dealing with fear, taking total responsibility, goal setting, all of that stuff. Because like I said, 80% of your success in anything is your mindset. It's your psychology. So, you know, make sure that that's right. Make sure that, that you know why you're doing what you're doing and why you want it, because that's 80% of it. Anything else on the difference between achievement and fulfillment? I know you make a pretty big distinction between those two. Yeah, no, I love talking about that because... Actually, I forgot to mention one thing. You know, I realized when I was floating in my pool looking up at this massive house and why I was depressed, there were actually two things going on. One was the fact that I didn't have, you know, like I said, I didn't have a vision for the future. I'd reached this massive goal and I was like, what's next? The second thing was the fact that I wasn't fulfilled. And so what I did actually is, and to give Tony Robbins a shout out, I went to one of his events and this was 16, 17 years ago. And at that time, I was pretty much a narcissist. I was, uh, it was all about Rod, me, 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 me. And I didn't contribute in any way past that except to my family. And, you know, I went and saw what he does and he does these, he feeds families for the holidays. So I decided to feed five families that year. It was like, like 2000, I think it was. And it totally changed my life. I went to a house and the lady answered the door and she was in this horribly decrepit home. And she came out and saw the food that I brought and started crying. And then her five kids came out and they all started crying. And then I started crying and I was hooked. And so every year after that, I fed families. And I'm blessed to say that in the last 16 years, we've fed pushing 50,000 children for the holidays with my foundation. We've done thousands of backpacks filled with school supplies to children. We've done thousands of teddy bears given to the local police departments for officers to have in their cars when they encounter a child that's experienced a traumatic event. And it's my greatest joy. And that's the fulfillment. And now, now don't be you know, intimidated by the scale of what I've done, because anybody can give back and get fulfillment just by smiling, deciding to smile at everybody they encounter that day or asking the barista at Starbucks how they're doing instead of them having to worry about how you're doing or, you know, just adding value. 
And it's not hard to give. Anything you give, you get back. If you give happiness, you get happiness back. If you give love, you get love back. And that's what gives you fulfillment. And please, those of you listening that are on your this massive road to success, don't lose sight of that because that would be a crime. And life's about being happy and fulfilled, not just about success. The secret to living is giving. I think that is something that Tony Robbins says, and that certainly can lead to fulfillment, true long-term fulfillment. Because, you know, a lot of these things like peace, joy, happiness, a lot of those things are just emotions. Emotions are more short-term. Fulfillment, I kind of think of that as more long-term. So, well, Rod, any final thoughts about the drive for success and investing in real estate as we wind down here? Those of you listening, if you haven't taken action, I mean, be prudent, do your homework, but take action. Everybody that buys real estate, their one regret is they didn't start sooner. And so just take action. Just go do it and do the goal setting, like I said, because you need to drive once once you hit those inevitable speed bumps and everybody has them. And you need to you know, know why you're doing what you're doing and why it's a must and get the pictures. The visual pictures really make a difference. At least they have in my life. Take action. No one ever made cash flow from the property that they never owned. Rod, how can our audience find out more about you? I wrote a book about multifamily investing that I'll give to your listeners for free. It's 200 pages long. It's called uh, How to Create Lifetime Cash Flow Through Multifamily Properties. Uh, And it's pretty much a textbook on buying multifamily real estate. And all they have to do is text my name, Rod, R-O-D, to 41411, and we'll give them a free copy. I've had rave reviews and thousands of people have gotten it. So I'm happy to do that. And uh, please check out my podcast. It's called Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. And you know, I do interview segments like you do, and, and I've had you on my show, and you really added value. And I do interviews, and then I do those five-minute psychology-related clips that really been well-received as well. So I'd love to, if you have anybody has an interest in multifamily, come check me out. Well, Rod, thanks so much. It's not just every day we can bring on someone that's owned and managed over 2,000 apartments and homes. So your collective experience on that sure has been valuable. Rod Cleef, thanks so much for coming on to Get Rich Education. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate it. It was fun. Are you looking to invest in your first investment property or grow your existing inventory? Highlands Residential Mortgage can help, offering down payments as low as 15% and credit score requirements down to 620. Their streamlined process is designed to help investors close their loans quickly and without any surprises. You need someone who knows cash flowing real estate and can help guide you through the muddy waters of today's lending environment. So call Graham Parham today, toll free at 855-326-6802. The Parham team can help you purchase or refinance any of your one to four family investment properties. NMLS number 195724-12001 North Central Expressway, Suite 750, Dallas, Texas 75243. Equal housing lender, not licensed in all states. As a lot of investors know, multifamily real estate has been one of the best asset classes to be invested in most of the last decade. While the great deals have been harder to find lately, there are still opportunities in select markets where savvy investors can get lots of appreciation and strong cash flow if you have a great team. Dave Zook, founder and president of The Real Asset Investor, and his team have been very active in the multifamily space in Memphis, Tennessee. On the heels of the Great Recession of 2009, Dave and his team quietly started acquiring multifamily assets, and in the last few years, He has syndicated over 2,000 apartment units, creating strong cash flow streams and big appreciation for lots of their investors. It's not too late to get involved. If you're an accredited investor and you would like to learn more about investing in great multifamily apartments with a world-class team, email Dave and his team at info at therealassetinvestor.com. This is Profit Boss Radio's Hillary Hendershot. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinholm and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to GRE and hey, give Rod credit for discussing mistakes and being so vulnerable. Basically, reaching the top of the real estate mountain and having a net worth of over $50 million down to zero. Check out Rod and his resources. He's a motivating guy. Rod lost out the first time around in real estate because he invested on speculative appreciation rather than cash flow. He's doing well now, and I think that shows that he's resilient. He's not a quitter. When other people lose big, they often just walk away forever. 
I think that even after getting wiped out, he knew that real estate was the vehicle. And this time around, he was going to embrace cash flow centric investing instead. I think you can make the argument that if you invest for anything other than cash flow, then you're not even investing, you're only speculating. And there are so many trade offs to consider between investing in single family or investing in multifamily apartments. Just making a quick hit here and totally speaking in generalities here, single family homes attract better tenants than apartment buildings. With single family, your property cost is lower, but it's higher on a per unit basis. Single family homes tend to be in better school districts than multifamily. You'll also pay a lower mortgage interest rate with single family homes. Loan availability is greater on single family. Two weeks ago, Graham Parham let us know that it's now easier to get loans for 10 single family homes. You can buy 10, all with 20% down payments. And then there are loan options beyond 10. With single family, your utility cost is often zero. Your tenant pays it all. With apartments, your utility cost can be substantial. With apartments, your property management costs can be lower. With apartments, your long-term maintenance expenses can be lower as you gain economies of scale advantage. Therefore, with apartments, your cash flow can be higher. With apartments, your investor education needs to be higher than it is with single family because with apartments, your risk level is greater and there's more to lose. With single family homes, they're in better locations and you have higher tenant quality and lower tenant turnover. Single-family homes tend to appreciate better than multifamilies as well. And begin with the end in mind. Single-family homes are considerably more liquid than multifamily. So on your exit strategy, since single-family homes have lower purchase prices than apartment buildings, if you want to get out, more people can afford to buy your single-family property from you In fact, you're even able to sell single-family homes to a pool of owner-occupant buyers, and they're the types of people that sometimes stretch to pay more for a property because they're not crunching cash-on-cash returns or cap rates. They don't even know or care about what that is because they're going to live there, okay? So owner-occupants don't buy 12 flexes. So there are just some quick trade-offs there between single-family and multifamily. Again, I can only speak in generalities there. In fact, if you want to delve deeper into that, I committed an entire episode to that topic last year. That was episode 65, and I think it was titled something like, What's Better, Single Family or Multifamily? But that was episode 65. Now, Rod self-managed for a while, kind of differently than what we do here, though I haven't said it on the air for a long time. I think it's helpful to self-manage for one to two years before passing your properties off to a property manager because you get to learn some things from the inside though it is not a requirement to self-manage at all. You see, with management, things usually go well with my rental properties. And when they do, I'm happy to have someone else, the manager, have their time taken away from them in maintaining that condition. That's their indelibly dented return on time invested, okay? So that's when things go well. And if things go badly at my property for a couple months and I've lost some money, Well, at least someone else was managing it, so I didn't lose my time, too. If I were managing a bad situation, I would have had a bad experience, plus be out the money and the time if I managed myself, okay? In fact, if I managed all of my own properties, then you wouldn't even know who I was because I wouldn't have time to do anything other than manage. And we've talked about contribution to others today. I couldn't contribute with this very show if I self-managed. I didn't even mention to you that for the third week in a row, I'm bringing you the show from the Keystone State, Pennsylvania. I'm deep in upstate Pennsylvania today. This is the state where I was born and raised. My family lives here. I'll be back in Anchorage next week. Now, being the Florida-based investor that Rod is, he told me that he really likes Jacksonville when we were talking off the air. He likes Jacksonville, Florida as an investment market. And you can find out more about cash flowing Jacksonville real estate and more of the best providers in investor advantage markets at greturnkey.com. As you're building wealth over time, you know, I think that a common question you ask yourself is, okay, what am I going to create for myself someday? Will I reach the top of the real estate mountain like Rod did? Where will I be someday? That's a totally valid question that you're asking yourself. But I think there's an even better question to ask yourself than, 
what am I going to create someday? And that is, what can I create today? It's about doing more with less now. And right now, you have more to work with than what you think. I've talked about that before with, like, for example, explaining why the return from home equity is always zero. And those are actually some usable dollars that you've got there. But I've got more for you. Now, if you work at a day job and you want a pay raise, but you're nervous about asking your boss for a raise, or you just know that one isn't even possible for you, well, then give yourself a raise. Yeah, on an upcoming show, I'm going to talk about exactly that, about how if you're an employee, you can give yourself a raise. Now, if you work a day job and you're also a real estate investor, like a lot of you are, you're going to benefit two ways because I'm going to tell you how to give yourself a raise at work and how to increase the rent on your tenants and how to make that rent increase stick. Remember, if you get a rent increase of 5%, depending on your leverage situation and more, a 5% rent increase, that could be a 20% cash flow increase to you. So rent income isn't actually what you feel. Cash flow is what you feel. So I'm going to talk very actionably about strategies to increase your income in a lot of different ways here on an upcoming show. I am here every Friday for you. You're not here for me. You're here for you. And I'm here to give you wealth building motivation, ideas, and actionable strategies every week. Here's a reminder to check out Rod and his resources and thank him for coming on today. And you know, sometimes deals are hard to find, but there are some really good deals out there. There are some markets where in 2006, people paid $120,000 for that same property that you can buy today for $100,000. So to take that action that Rod told you is so important and get access to properties, visit greturnkey.com. I will be back next week to help you build your wealth. Until then, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Though you might quit your day job, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. Flow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide. This is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid South Home Buyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated, even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers Friendly Staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, getricheducation.com.